Welcome. I'm Glenn Anderson with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. For more than 25 years, this TV series has explored a variety of issues relating to peace, social justice, and nonviolent social change. Since World War II, and especially since the collapse of the Soviet Union more than 20 years ago, the United States has been the world's number one military power. And indeed, the United States has used military power continuously since the 1940s in many places around the world. The justifying buzzword has always been national security, as if a bigger military and more nuclear weapons and more military attacks on other countries would make our nation more secure. But even after all of this, Americans feel insecure. Militarism is always promoted as a solution, but what if militarism is actually the problem? What if excessive militarism hurts the United States? This is the question that our guests will explore during this hour. We have uh, two guests active with the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Beyond the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation, we have a Western Washington level with an office in Seattle, and we have a national level and an international level. And we also have chapters in other counties and other parts of the country, including Lewis County, just to the south of Thurston County. I'm happy to welcome Ellen Finkelstein. She's the organizer for the Western Washington FOR, and Larry Kirshner, who is active in uh, the FOR chapter in Lewis County, the Fire Mountain chapter, and both have extensive experience organizing uh, Ellen in Chicago and elsewhere, and Larry active with Veterans for Peace and other organizations. So good to have both of you here. Uh, let's help people figure out at the outset just how militarized is the United States since World War II. Uh, could either of you tell us about the number of military bases, for example? So I know that a number of experts, Zoltan Grossman from Evergreen State College and Chalmers Johnson say that we have about, I think it's a thousand military bases outside of the United States, mm -hmm. and about that number are about 700 within the United States. So mm -hmm. that's a lot of bases. Uh -huh. We uh, pay for that through our tax dollars. Yes. And so our federal budget is heavily militarized as well. I want to show a couple of images that will illustrate that point. This uh, pie chart uh, from the War Resisters League uh, reflects uh, a, a common way of looking at this where if we recognize that the military budget does not include everything that actually is a military spending item because the federal government does not count as a military item nuclear weapons which are in the Department of Energy budget or Veterans Affairs which is one cost of past wars, or the military's share of the national debt, which is huge, we actually end up with about half of the federal budget being used for military purposes, even though it's not in the Department of Defense budget. Here's another uh, breakout uh, from the National Priorities Project, and they show uh, the, the dark gray part as the military and then the little pipe chart wedges as everything else uh, from their breakout. And that's National Priority Project. Uh, at, uh, and we'll give their reference at the end of the show. Um, in, in relation to other countries, you can see how huge the US uh, budget is from 2010. This is global military expenditures uh, with the United States far and away the, the biggest, uh, China second with only 119 billion, and then Britain, France, Russia, Japan, Saudi Arabia, Germany, Italy, uh, India and Italy trailing way, way, way down. Um, so we are heavily militarized in uh, the economy, in the budget, and then it has repercussions throughout the economy. Um, I'm, <clears throat> I was watching a football game last week, and prior to the game, the announcer said, um, this 
uh, game today is being showed on the Armed Forces Network to members of the U.S. military in 175 countries around the world. And they were saying uh, what a great thing for the military to be able to watch this football game with uh, Americans not considering what does it mean that we have the military in 175 yeah. countries yeah. around the world. I think there's about a little over 200 countries recognized. Yeah. Yeah. So that shows the spread of the military imperialism. Yeah. And, and the, the propaganda that comes out of Washington, D.C. is that we've been cutting and we're actually not cutting. Uh, we're, we're still increasing. And then the, the debate is how much should we increase? Right. A whole lot right. or some. Right. But it already has been increasing a whole lot right. for the last decade. And they, they talk about how they can't possibly see how they can keep a ready military uh, cutting from the increase of the spending when we already spend, as your chart showed, you know, more than all the other countries combined. Mm -hmm. um, who, who is the enemy that we're spending all this money to protect ourselves from? Yeah, well, it's, it's some of those 135 countries where we have troops right. <laughs> because we're being attacked by our, you know, our allies in right. Afghanistan and elsewhere. Right. Did you have something to add? Uh, no, not right now. Okay. Um, so, you know, we're heavily militarized, and, and you pointed out that, that we were actually coming from a long history of this, that uh, even though it, uh, militarization increased sharply with World War II and ever since, it actually goes back way beyond that before. Yeah, if you go back to the, to the beginning of the country, the, the founding fathers uh, pretty much all agreed that a standing army was a terrible thing to have. And that continued, for the most part, even past the First World War to the 30s before the public as a whole started considering the possibility of having a permanent standing army. And that um, at Second World War, obviously they had a huge army. Mm -hmm. At the end of the Second World War, there was a movement to demobilize again. Mm -hmm. And that was um, stopped by those in power for a number of reasons. They, they claimed that if we went back to the non-standing army time that the depression would resume. They, they, they mm -hmm. sold it as a way to avoid yeah. returning to the depression yeah, Military years. Keynesianism. Exactly. But in practice, you'd actually create more jobs. Research from economists and lots of folks have shown that a given billion of dollars would create more jobs spent on domestic right. programs than on military, but they still right, but, rely on but, right. but, but they were smart enough to, to spread what jobs they did create all around, so there's a little bit of the pie in every yeah. congressional district, so it's hard to find someone in Congress who's willing to say no because it means right. jobs yeah. in their but, district. But they don't right. count the school teachers that get laid off. Exactly. We've got school teachers in right. every district. Right. we right. got librarians right. in every district. we got bus drivers in every district. Right. And they don't count those when they get laid off. Right. right, and they never look at, as you said, Glenn, sort of the difference between what investments would be. So it's like three times the amount of jobs we'd create it, with a billion it, dollars yeah. for education yeah. as we would in the military. Yeah, yeah. Um, tell us something, Ellen, about what the troops have been experiencing lately, because we've been sending these people off to war, and over and over and over again, multiple deployments, what's going on? So one of the changes over the past 10, 15 years is this redeployment phenomenon that we're seeing, mm -hmm. and particularly in and around Joint Base lewis McCord, I think people see evidence of what the uh, costs are to human beings. So we have many, many soldiers returning with post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. Their families are experiencing secondary post-traumatic yeah. stress of what it means to be living. And uh, the suicide rates have yeah. rocketed, skyrocketed. Uh, in July, the rate of suicide, there were 28 suicides. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's more than people being killed in Afghanistan yeah, the, right now. Yeah, the rate of, the rate of uh, suicides, um, and, and the, uh, we're getting twice as many suicides per year 
of active duty troops and veterans as the number of people who died on September 11. Exactly. At, on those attacks. So if this is somehow our response to that, we are, our, our government, our nation is committing suicide rather than responding uh, appropriately because, you know, we're, we're just bringing it on ourselves. And we're, we're taking the militarism that we're exporting and we're importing it back into our communities mm, yeah. so that people are seeing the uh, effects of that in their daily lives yeah. if they live in any of those communities. Yeah, domestic violence, crime That's rates, it. a lot of uh, traffic problems mm -hmm. by people driving erratically after having been deployed and, and so forth. Um, one of the biggest heroes from World War II, Dwight David Eisenhower, got elected president of the United States twice in the 50s. And I want to quote something that he said that people are generally aware of, but it's worth repeating. Um, uh, a few months after taking office as president, Eisenhower said this in a speech in April 1953. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft from those who are hunger, who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. This is not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. So this is from a guy who knows firsthand, and we no longer have that wisdom coming from either party of the, of the two big parties. Uh, small parties uh, all agree with Eisenhower mm -hmm. and go beyond that. Um, other, can you tell us anything else about the, the cost of militarization? I'm thinking like to the Reagan era or along the way? Well, I mean, if, you look at, if you look at Reagan himself, uh, his administration put the United States more in debt than all the previous uh, administrations before him. Um, and during his presidency, we went from being a creditor nation to being a debtor nation. Mm -hmm. So uh, we not only have continued our military imperialism around the world, we've borrowed the money in which to do it, which mm -hmm. in the long run has destroyed our economy. And we look at the shambles that we have today it started with Reagan. Uh, Clinton did the same thing to some extent mm -hmm. in Bosnia and some other places. Um, then Bush, Iraq, um, uh, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. totally unfunded wars. Mm -hmm. um, Obama, Libya. There, you know, these these are areas where we're just spending huge amounts of money that we don't have. So it comes back to make the non-military portions of the economy less vibrant mm -hmm. and less uh, able to produce the jobs people need. Mm -hmm. So it sucks the marrow out yeah. of the economy. And, and we need to think also about what is it that we get from this? Do we really get security mm -hmm. right. or are we sowing the seeds of, of new problems? Are we provoking terrorism? Right. Right. Are we recruiting more terrorists? Um, we, we seem to think that, that militarization uh, will will solve our problems and actually the it provokes more violence and I wonder if either of you could tell us about the cycles of violence in US foreign policy um, I mean if you look at look at uh, if you go back over history and look at the, the many times that we have uh, done an incursion in some place it inevitably creates enemies because we kill innocent people every time we do something like that we kill innocent people and so the family and friends of that person who's been killed becomes our enemy legitimately because of what we've done and then we kill some of them and then their friends you know if you look at Iraq when we invaded Iraq there was no Al Qaeda in Iraq yeah. and now there's Al Qaeda in Iraq yeah. when I was in Afghanistan recently we were in Bamiyan province and it was considered the, the, the safest province, not that they're all, any of them are really safe, but it was the safest province in Afghanistan directly because there were no American troops in that province. Mm -hmm. If the American troops are there, they are a magnet for violence because the people know what the United States has done 
militarily around the world. So every time, you know, every time we do, we, like I say, every time we kill somebody, we create a new enemy. People, when the towers were attacked on 9-11, on people said, why, why do they hate us? So, so few Americans know anything about the history of this country and what we have done to um, steal resources, to imprison people, to uh, go out of our way to create enemies around yeah. the world. It's, it's no wonder that, that, that we get what the CIA yeah. calls a blowback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ellen? I, and even if we look at Afghanistan and what we did prior to this go round with Afghanistan, we helped cause, or in right. fact caused, exactly. the Taliban to exist in the way that it did. We left people in the lurch. Yeah. Um, and then the consequences of not helping people, both in Afghanistan, we did it in Iraq as well, yeah. in the first Gulf War, where we left people who had come to believe that we were their allies and we were going to be helpful to them in some way, and we just left. Yeah. The, the Afghanistan example you're referring to is when the Soviet Union was right. occupying Afghanistan, trying to make it something that would serve the interests mm -hmm. of the Soviet Union's politics, and the United States was funding uh, the Mujahideen. Uh, we were arming people to overthrow the, the government of, 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 uh, of Afghanistan, and so we were seeking a military solution, and then after having armed those folks, then they became a problem that we now fight against. I, I read, uh, I've read a number of times uh, how many occasions we've had in the last several decades where the United States troops are fighting against people in some country who had been armed by the United States in a previous go around. You right. know? So we had this war in, Pakistan, in, in Panama uh, after we had had uh, Manuel Noriega as our CIA guy, and we were arming him, and then we didn't like him anymore. Uh, and so the United States had a war in Panama, and it was their U.S. guns shooting back at us. I wouldn't call it a war in Panama, though. It was more of a massacre Well, it was. Panama. Yeah, it was. But yeah. I mean, the, yeah. we, we keep yeah. arming dictators, and we keep arming thugs and nasty people who then, when the government turns. Well, I mean, the Shah of Iran was a classic example right. where mm -hmm. they had a democracy in Iran until the United States and Britain overthrew the democracy and installed the Shah, this really, really brutal, nasty guy, and we kept arming him, I mean, arming him with our right. best weapons until finally the people overthrew him, and then they were mad at us, so they took U.S. hostages, and now we've been mad at Iran now since uh, 1979, uh, if, that, you know, and, and we and, are again. And, and here we are. It's just a, a constant go around. If, if you look at the, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the foreign policy advisors who've had a strong voice in what America has done since the Second World War, right after the Second World War, it was John and Alan Dulles. Hmm. Then it was Henry Kissinger. Then it was Zbigniew Brzezinski. Mm -hmm. those, those people all think that the, the first option has to be force. Yeah. And they are all people who've had an incredible influence on the policy to the point where they're, they're, you know, the ones that are still alive are considered criminals in a large part of the world. Right. I mean, Kissinger can't go to a lot of countries yeah. because he's seen as a war criminal right, mm -hmm. right. because of what yeah. do, he convinced the United States to do. Yeah. You mentioned the word force, and that they, they use that as a euphemism. It's, the use of force. I think of force as if I have a pickle jar and the lid is on really tight, I have to really work on it to force that pickle jar lid open. That's force. What these guys are talking about is violence right. and killing. Mm -hmm. right. So they, it, but they'll say use of force when they really mean use of massive violence. Right, dominating violence. And, and killing people, yeah. yeah. Well, right. and many of them and many of our other leaders have had uh, interest in those who have produced the weapons right. and you know, we can look at Dick Cheney and his relationship to Halliburton and yeah. all sorts of other things and see how there are interests so that, um, to use the analogy, you know, you always think the military is the answer. You always mm. think the use of violence is going to be the answer. It's the, I have a hammer, everything looks like a nail yeah. idea. Yeah. yeah. And, and here, I want to just show a, a picture of one of the 
the, one of the uh, current toys. toys for the boys. And these drones are not just some cute toy. These things are so lethal. Um, and the United States currently is using them to kill people, to assassinate people and everybody around them mm -hmm. on the mere suspicion that this is somebody we don't like and we're guessing where that person probably is based on, quote, intelligence, unquote, and then we shoot some nasty weapon that kills supposedly them and everybody around them, but it's all on su suspicion. And in this country, you're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. But we have instead a President Obama who thinks it's okay to kill somebody just because they're a suspect, right. and then everybody else around them right. who may be innocent. Right. Yeah. And yeah. one of the things about the drones is that we've got this complete detachment of the people that are um, running the drones far, far away here or wherever, right. and the calculations are being done in this sort of very cold sort yeah. of algorithm of what's possible and what's not, and what do we know and what don't we know, and does it matter, oh, let's fire. Yeah. So that yeah. The, the, the human costs yeah. are not being seen by those who are operating the drones right. at they're, all. They're in a, a nice U.S. military yeah. base in the United States. In the United States, doing air this conditioned. Remote, remote control, yeah. The whole deal. And stop off on the way home, buy a pizza for the family. Right. Right. And in the old days, if you're out on the battlefield, you're seeing the other people face to face and, and you have an experience of what that's about. Mm -hmm. And for these folks, it's, it's like a video game. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the statistics of the time during the war when people actually were face to face, a large, more than a majority of them did not shoot at each other. Because it's yes. not a normal thing for people to kill each other. Yeah. But if you, if you have so removed yourself from the, the end result of the violence, that it's a video game, uh -huh. there's no compunction to not do it, because that, that's not real. Right, yeah, so people have been trained to dehumanize, right. and then that comes back in the PTSD. Right. absolutely. And, and the domestic violence against your spouse or the kids or... Right. And one of the things in terms of that we're certainly seeing is that people are retrained and trained to um, not think about the moral consequences and the mm -hmm. hair trigger sorts of things, mm -hmm. but there isn't any training to unlearn that when you yeah. come home. So yeah. that's still there. Yeah, you need to be deprogrammed right. in some way, and, and they don't recognize that because what they've done with the training is so personality changing and so corrupting and perverting that it, it would really take some heavy therapy to. Yeah, the military to claims that. that they do some. But when I came back from Vietnam, I was 48 hours from being in the jungle to being on the streets of Seattle a civilian. And I don't think that what they're doing with the troops yeah. today is any more effective than what they didn't do yeah. with us. Well, you look at, look at the results. I mean, yeah. look at all the suicides. Look at all the domestic violence. Right. Look at the crime rate. Yeah. Look at the, 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 the screwy driving. Right. If you, if you include do. depression along with PTSD, 40% or more of the soldiers are affected by some mental right. disorder. Yeah, there, There's another change over these decades that we should be talking about that I know both of you are concerned about. The United States Constitution says, okay, if you're gonna have a war, Congress declares it. The president can't just go off and have some war. The people who, who wrote the Constitution and adopted it knew that, that there was a risk of having the ego of a president involved or a narrow number of people calling the shots and that they'd have to run it through Congress and have Congress actually declare a war. And we, we don't do that. We gave up on that. The last the war time. that was declared was the Second World War. Yeah, yeah. everything else is, they've just been doing. And, and many of these wars, the presidents have lied to Congress about the, the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Gulf of Tonkin. The Gulf of Tonkin resolution resulted because Lyndon Johnson and Robert McNamara and all those people actually lied to Congress because the Pueblo, that, that ship was actually in North Vietnamese waters right. doing military things against North Vietnam, and they lied. They said, no, it was in international right. waters. And you look at all the lies that the Bush regime did right. to get us into uh, Iraq, and right. case after case after case is based on lies. Right, the first Bush, his, his, his reason for invading Panama was that Manuel Noriega was this big drug dealer um, 
And so they ended up killing 3,000 Pan innocent Panamanians, whereas three months prior to that, Noriega was meeting with Bush in the White House mm -hmm. because he was a CIA agent. The problem was that he decided to start doing what he wanted to do, yeah. not what the U.S. wanted to do. It had yeah. nothing to do with his drugs. Well, and Saddam Hussein used to be an ally. Saddam Hussein. Was an ally. We've all seen the picture had, of had him with Rumsfeld. Shaking hands yeah. with Rumsfeld. Yeah. Right. Uh, but he, he was going to be our guy going right. against Iran, which the United States was angry with at the right. time, right. and now is again. Um, how, how did we get the military to get out of control? What happened? Well, I think it started with um, having a permanent standing army, which required that you have a permanent general staff um, and professional soldiers. Uh, so that became a group that was educated and had their own needs and desires and expectations. And um, I think slowly the idea that that the, the military was subservient to the civilians was lost um, in the minds of the military. It started during Kennedy, I th Kennedy's time, I think. The, the military there th thought that he was such a weak sister that he wouldn't invade Cuba like they suggested that he do. Um, and... Um, Kennedy realized what bad advice he was getting from the military. Mm -hmm. So that's about the same time that McNamara and the civilian uh, military planners who weren't military started making decisions. Um, and ultimately you ended up with civilians like Rumsfeld in charge of the military um, who was an ideologue on top of being a civilian. Yeah. Uh, when McNamara and those people there, they weren't ideologues. They were, they were trying to find the most efficient way to, to win a war. So that, that was their thing. And they thought the military had a narrow viewpoint and weren't taking into consideration the political ideas. So um, there's been this battle or seesaw between the military paying attention to the civilians and the civilians trying to control the military. And now you have all of the the generals who retire go to become members of the arms dealers, yeah. corporations, and members of the arms dealers, corporations come into the Defense Department to be advisors. Yeah. So there's this incestuous yeah. thing going on now where it's difficult to tell the difference between the civilians and the military. And Ellen, what's your take I, well, on this? Well, I was going to say, I, I think that part of what has also happened is you know, we all learn lessons from the last war, right? And mm -hmm. we fight the last war. So I think that part of the lesson that was learned from Vietnam was that it was a problem when there was a draft and when everybody knew people who were in the war and fighting. So there was this development of not having the draft. Mm -hmm. And then as we've had the all-volunteer army, um, smaller and smaller number of Americans actually experience what it means to have us engaged in all these military conflicts. So it's a very small percentage. Mm -hmm. Then we have the additional sort of added in of privatization of a lot mm -hmm. of military stuff. So I think most people aren't really aware right. when we look at who's in Afghanistan that there's more military contractors there right now than there are military yeah. troops. Yeah. So some of the numbers that we see about deaths, about suicides, about all those things, we're talking about just the military. We don't know yeah. what else is going yeah. on. And then the, with, with all those private contractors making a lot of money, mm -hmm. then you have an additional lobby right. who's pushing for uh, more aggressive foreign policies. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's go here. Let's go there. Because for these corporations, they're making a huge amount of profit with massive corruption and fraud, you, you see documentation of bits and pieces of that, and there's a whole lot more corruption and fraud that's not accounted for. And so, um, like with, with Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense under uh, the second Bush, wanting to privatize everything, he created all of these special interest groups that would profit massively from um, escalations of wars and 
crazy spending and talk with anybody who's been there and they'll say they built stuff and it was crap and it fell apart and you know. yeah we were talking earlier about a, a lot of Americans don't, aren't aware of the North North American command that the uh -huh. military the president developed in 2002 um, they have a military structure that's set up to handle any kind of military uprising in Canada the US Mexico or Cuba and I just heard the other day that the, the general who is currently in charge of that is the same general who was in charge of the reconstruction projects in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. which have been shown to be so totally ineffective. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like the Peter Principle. They have kicked him upstairs, so now he's in charge. He's got the 173rd Airborne at his beck and call to make sure that the Americans don't rise up against their government. Yeah. Uh, there, there's another angle I want to mention, and then we'll move on to the next thing, and that's uh, Michael Clare, who's done just excellent research and writing for decades. I've always enjoyed reading his stuff. He said, oil dependency is the crucial pivot of American foreign policy and military policy. And he said that at the event that the three of us had worked mm -hmm. on, yeah. uh, a, a peak oil conference in Seattle uh, in, uh, in May 2005. But that was Michael Clare, that you look at the oil and realize how that's driving things. Um, the culture of militarism has really taken on uh, such a magnitude that it, it really is one of the most powerful and dominant institutions in the country. Uh, you know, Congress wants to slash food stamps and energy conservation and you know education, everything, but they want to keep on beefing up the military. Uh, they keep funding weapon systems that the Pentagon says they don't want. Right. right. Um, it's just out of control, and the mainstream news media are so deferential to the news media that even when some general says something that's blatantly baloney, uh, the news media just sort of accept it at face value, and they print it as if it were true. Uh, well, how, you know, is there anything else you can say about how we developed this culture of militarism? Um, how did it get out of control beyond <laughs> what we've said? Is there, any, I just, is there anything else? Well, I mean, a lot of it has to do with uh, money and power in politics. I mean, you're talking about... Uh, um, systems that a good portion of the military doesn't want. Uh, Maria Cantwell and Patty Murray were responsible for Boeing getting a $30 billion contract yeah. to make these uh, tankers, tankers. Yeah. that yeah. a lot of the military said Second, were necessary. Yeah. Well, it yeah. was fine for the Second World War, mm -hmm. but it isn't some, that isn't the kind of war we fight anymore. Well, and it was after Boeing had already uh, gotten, gotten caught doing some right. blatantly illegal mm -hmm. Uh, shenanigans. Right. Uh, shenanigans so, are so it's, probably a you know, euphemism. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a culture of corruption uh, um, and power, yeah. you know, basically. But I'd also say it's for outside of sort of that circle of the military and the contractors and the military industrial complex. I think that there's a part of our culture in general Mm -hmm. that we want to feel safe, right? We all want security. Mm -hmm. So there, if the myth, if the lie is spoken often enough that yeah. what makes you safe mm -hmm. is those weapon systems right. and going and uh, intervening and taking our force with us, all of these 175 right. nations, mm -hmm. then people are inclined to believe it because they want to feel safe. Yeah. And they, not enough of those people watch this TV program. Right, they, the do, they don't listen to us. Or do, us or do they even think about yeah. in their own life, not thinking about the big picture in their own life, what, is, what right. are the things they do that make them right. feel what, safe? What makes they you know feel their safe? Neighbor, what? They have a job, they pay their bills, they pay the police. I, I think you had a story about something uh, raising this issue and it was about kill, how many Iraqis? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell, so, tell that story. So um, it's not me, it's actually someone. Who was it? I, I believe it was someone in Olympia. Okay. Um, who was at a vigil. Um, okay. Um, opposing the wars and got in a conversation with someone who. Uh, didn't particularly agree with the fact that they were there, whoever was there um, asking for the troops to come home mm -hmm. from Afghanistan and Iraq. And in conversation, it became clear that this, this man uh, had two children in the military and was worried about their safety mm -hmm. and what not funding the military would mean. 
And the, the person at the vigil asked the question in listening, said, I understand that you're really concerned about your kids, and that makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense to me. How many Iraqis would have to die for you to feel like your kids were safe? And the response was, I don't know the answer to that. I have to think about that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the question is, for all of us, is, as Larry just said, like, what really makes me feel safe? Yeah. Yeah. Health care, yeah. housing, a roof yeah. over my head, yeah. 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 you know, a job. Right. The, we, uh, when you mentioned the vigil story, um, I remember, uh, oh, this was a couple of decades ago. I was holding a, a, a sign at our uh, Wednesday Peace Vigil, and the sign said, it asked a question. It says, is war really necessary? Mm -hmm. And a guy walked by quite briskly. He didn't stop to engage in conversation. He just walked by and kind of tossed out a, a, a retort. He says, yeah, sometimes you got to beat them up. And he walked on. And I thought he was envisioning himself as the beater, not the beat e. Mm -hmm. There's something about being an American that lets us think that we have an inherent right, an entitlement to beat up on other people mm -hmm. to get them to do what we want. This guy would never have said, sometimes I need to get beaten up from his own perspective. No, he saw himself as a beater of other people. And that leads back to you, a little bit ago, you started to say something about culture. And I thought you were going to talk about the culture of the military, but the question went off another way. But I was thinking mm -hmm. uh, in response to that, if you look at the culture of the military today that produces some of the results that we see is there's a very strong evangelical conservative Christian element mm -hmm. that is strong in the military. Yeah. There's rampant sexism, one yeah. out of three women in the military yeah. are sexually assaulted, yeah. and there's incredible racism. Yeah. And it, it, a lot of it goes back to the American exceptionalism idea. We're, we're exceptions to history, and yeah. what we do is okay. Yeah, we, our country is a shining example on the hill for everybody else, and we exactly. have entitlement to be able to tell everybody else and, what to and do. And this, this is part and parcel through, through the military. The, the fellow who who shot the Sikhs in Minnesota in, in in August. last August, um, he said that if you, when you go into the military, if you're not a racist, you'll be one when you come yeah. out. Yeah. I was um, talking, a couple of years ago, I was talking with a, a Muslim friend who said that, he, uh, he was, and he was in the, in the Army, and he said that in the Army, he was receiving training about what Islam is like and what mm -hmm. Muslims are like, and he said, that stuff wasn't even true. Yeah. And it was part of his training as a US Army soldier. And he was a Muslim and he knew better than that. But they were being the troops were being indoctrinated with, with anti Muslim bias. Right. Well the, the whole basis, the whole basic uh, Christian evangelical thing is that um, you're right, you you do one thing in your life, say that you're turn yourself over to Jesus, mm -hmm. that makes everything okay. Beyond that point, you can you can do it all. They won't say this, but that's yeah. that's the way it's they're, they're, portrayed, and that's yeah. the cultural thought that, that right. proceeds from that. There's some of that, but there's nothing of forgiveness, nothing exactly, of, uh, Not, nothing grace. about what Jesus you know, said. God to say. is all about grace and reconciling, right. and Jesus right. said that God makes the rain fall on the bad people as well as the good people, right. and you know we're all in this together. And so, it, it's, I mean, it, it's the gospel of redemptive violence. violence? That, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I want to share a, a thing from Martin Luther King who said, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. And I, so I think there's something beyond the politics and the economics and the, the health concerns and, and the psychology of this, but it, it goes to a spiritual thing. And I, I'm concerned that this excess of militarism, this, this love of violence is, is hurting the soul of the nation in a, in a very profound way. And I think the rest of the world understands that, and they're just astounded that the American people let our government do this. I, I don't think it's a love of violence among the people. I think it's willfully turning our eyes away from the violence that's being done in our name. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think if you pin any individual down, they're, they're going to be opposed to violence, whereas you know most people are opposed to the death penalty if you really mm -hmm. pin them down. The people yeah. individually are opposed to it. But Americans are so used to being told we're special uh -huh. and that the rules don't apply to us, mm -hmm. that we're willing to turn our eyes away from the violence that's being done yeah. in our name. And if people feel powerless 
we got two big parties that both promote war and both have stupid budget priorities when right. we know better. Right. People feel powerless. You know, I'm so small, the system is so big, what can I do? Well, the, so people sort of give the up. The system just reinforces that idea, too. Yeah, they, they don't, want, they they don't they, teach history, yeah. so people don't know how to yeah. think about things right. like that. And we were talking earlier, I also think that it's what if people really grasp what was going on? Right. What would they have to change mm -hmm. about their lives and perhaps give up a little bit or do mm -hmm. right. to make a difference? Uh -huh. um, when we talked about the, the, the troops, the PTSD, and all of this sort of, sort of thing, um, it's happening at such a proportion that I think of this as a public health epidemic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when you have a public health epidemic, where we're just wiping out a whole generation of young Americans, it's not enough to say, well, let's give some treatment to those individuals who are being hurt by this. We have to do prevention. Right. On any public health epidemic, you have to do prevention. And the prevention, I think, would be um, getting to the root of the problem, stop dehumanizing people in other countries, stop dehumanizing ourselves, not stop pretending that it's okay to kill people, uh, and and stop the wars and stop this militarism. We need to to change the, the, the culture back in order to stop this really self-destructive. You believe that because you've thought about it. Most people don't want to think about it. Well, it, I mean, it, I, I think it's I think it's pretty obvious if you look at the at if the you look at it public health. Right. Epidemic. Right. Yeah. You know, you have to say what's going on and why and what's the remedy. Well, look, I mean. What are there, 6,000 soldiers a year or military year that are committing suicide yeah, right now? Right. Yeah. There's 40,000 people a year that are dying on the highways. So where are our priorities? Uh, you know, yeah. people, people don't want to look at all of uh -huh. the implications. Yeah. And it's, you know, somebody said uh, that the, the current war machine is 1% of the people fighting wars for the other 1%. Uh -huh. yeah. And the 98% in the middle just throw yeah. up their hands. T tell us something briefly about what some of the uh, soldiers that you know and veterans are doing through, well, you're, you're already a member of Veterans for Peace, yes, and you have done a lot of work with Iraq Veterans Against the War, and Coffee Strong, the GI Coffee House near Joint Base Lewis McCord. Tell us something of what's going on there. So they're sort of going at exactly what you just mentioned in terms of looking at um, the epidemic of Troops who are being redeployed who are traumatized in one way or another, post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, mm -hmm. military sexual trauma, yeah. and they are working with people on base and off base and looking at ways both to support people in gaining both physical and mental health uh, access to, but also I think underlying that is the notion that these people should not, who have already been traumatized in some way or another, should not be being redeployed. Yeah, and re-traumatized. And, and re-traumatized, yeah, yeah. and then brought back to communities. And from a perspective of someone who's interested overall in peace and justice, I would further say, and Iraq Veterans Against the War says, if we stopped deploying traumatized troops, we wouldn't have the troops to send off to Afghanistan mm -hmm. and Libya and Iran mm -hmm. and wherever else we yeah. might go. So there's yeah. a long reason, list yeah. of reasons to support the work that they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, you remember the old slogan from the Vietnam era, what if they gave a war and nobody Never came? came. Right. And so one strategy would be to, to shut off the supply of um, victims, mm -hmm. people right. to become victims and re-victimized. There was uh, a strong movement, uh, GI resistance during the Vietnam yes. War. And I think that's another thing that we can do would be to encourage yeah. GI resistance among the people who are currently yeah. in. And it doesn't necessarily mean a, a violent fragging your officer kind of thing. There are many ways to resist the military machine without being violent. Yeah. And, and, and people are aware of this kind of stuff. There's another quotation from Martin Luther King who said, have we not come to such an impasse in the modern world that we must love our enemies or else? The chain reaction of evil, hate begetting hate, wars producing more wars, must be broken or else we shall be plunged into the dark abyss of annihilation. 
And so there's that from him. And I like the quotation from the child in this story by Hans Christian Andersen, who says, the emperor has no clothes. Right. And sometimes it takes a kid to say, hey, right. you know, this is, this is baloney. Right. And I think part of what we're also saying is, it's not just that it's bad or immoral that we're doing this. It doesn't work. Exactly. It doesn't get us exactly. where we want to get yeah. to. It's well, not a rational thing. And I, I want to, if we want to get to where we want to get to, if we want to get security, there's this national security model that we've been talking about, which says spend more on the military, shoot more people, invade more countries, grab whatever you can of other people's resources, uh, beat the crap out of stuff. But there's a better way to get to real security, true security, and that would be to recognize that we should cooperate with each other. Mm -hmm. There would be enough resources for everybody if we would share and not take more than our share. Um, instead of thinking about security at somebody else's expense, recognize that if we all collaborate, we can help each other uh, achieve uh, good relationships so we can get along and not be a threat to each other, have economic well-being for all, respect everybody's rights, uh, and use nonviolent methods. And uh, it's just the whole thing about recognizing our common humanity instead of being motivated by fear that results in hatred right. and violence. And um, we, we could have global community instead of global chaos. But it's a, it needs that change to a different model. Well, even the, the ability to perceive that, that maybe there is a different model. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, to, and to invest in that different model, I ran across a statistic that the world in general spends $1 to address conflict resolution to close to $2,000 in war spending. And, right. thing. and imagine what it would be like if we just shifted a little bit. We might be more effective. I yeah. believe we would. I think yeah. we all believe yeah. we'd be more effective. Yeah, there's this old saying that says you get what you pay for. Right. right. And if we're paying for war, we're going to get more war. And if we would pay more for good conflict resolution methods, then we would solve problems better. Um, there, there's this old uh, uh, saying about, you know, you got to fight fire with fire. And you really don't. You fight you fire, with, fire water. with water. Exactly. It's a whole different <laughs> thing. Gene Sharp says if you fight violence with violence, or if you fight with violence, you're fighting with your enemy's best weapons. Mm -hmm. And so Gene Sharp, who's not a pacifist, says we've got to shift to nonviolent ways of defending ourselves and in other countries and making the changes that we want to have. Um, Think of how many trillions of dollars we've spent on nuclear weapons that nobody ever wants to use. Yeah. And those same trillions, had they been spent on clean water education, roads, hospitals around the world, what kind of world would we have yeah. today? Yeah. We yeah. would have friends. We wouldn't have yeah. people. Enemies. That's right, yeah. yeah. But instead, we spend all this money to... to to kill people, and that just antagonizes them. I know I would be mad if somebody was shooting at me. Exactly. Or killing my family members. Or yeah. um, the, the, This alternative vision that we want is part of the alternative vision of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Yeah. And I want us to share something of that experience, because all three of us are active with, with the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Um, tell us something of what we do. You're, at, you're on staff in I Seattle. Am as our organizer for the Western Washington level, and you and I are volunteers with local chapters, you in Lewis County and me in Olympia. Tell us something about the FOR. So as you say, FOR really does um, stand for a lot of what we've been talking about, about that alternative and other way. And we try in lots of different ways and lots of different issues connected um, to address some of those issues, to try and stop some of the militarism and the effects that we've been talking about, and to offer some alternatives. A couple of the particular things that have been um, important in the last couple of years for Western Washington Fellowship of Reconciliation are uh, what we've called Bring Our Billions Home campaign, which has been looking at all of the money that we've been spending on these wars, particularly in Iraq and Afghanistan, and looking at what would happen if we stopped those wars and redirected the money to all of the needs here at home. So that's one way in a lot of different ways, both in Olympia with legislatures and education and some other activities that people throughout the state have been looking at some of these issues. Another really important program to me personally um, that also ties to this issue is we run a summer program with high school students from 
the general Seattle but broader area. We've had people from uh, down in Centralia and other places in the state participate. And it is a way of helping to light other torches of other generations to look at some of these issues. Um, this past year in 2012, they really focused on looking at some of what we've been talking about today in terms of violence and nonviolence and uh, were particularly moved and uh, moved to action by meeting with some of the young veterans at mm -hmm. Coffee Strong. So that's another way that we, mm -hmm. as Western Washington FOR, really try to make those connections. Yeah, and you've got a chapter, you've been doing a peace vigil every Saturday at the edge of the park. Yeah, we're in our, our, we're in our 10th year of that. Yeah. Um, uh, Lewis County is the most conservative political county in Western Washington, and when we started that vigil, um, every, you know, a third of the people who went by would give us the finger. And now, um, if one person goes by and does that on a Saturday, we're surprised because yeah. the, the, the attitude, I think, in some ways, uh, Lewis County is kind of indicative of the country as a whole. It's mm -hmm. kind of a bellwether. And we could see the attitude change there as the attitude in the country as a whole changed. Yeah. Um, I think two uh, kids from Lewis County died in, in the wars. Um, mainly, we're a small chapter, and our main idea is to try to educate people to get them to at least consider other possibilities. We write letters to the editor. Um, we hold occasional uh, public meetings mm -hmm. just to try and to get speakers, people. Speakers. Speakers. Yeah. We try to get people to... Yeah to just think about things. I mean, yeah. we figure we're successful if we get someone to even think about another possibility. I, I, I like the, the origin of the, of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. It started in Europe in 1914 and in the United States in 1915, and it started in 14 when uh, some religious leaders in Europe were got together and had a conference and said, what can we do as the religious community to help prevent this war that looks like it's going to be coming? And so they had people from the various countries and they got together and, and they, as that conference was ending, World War I was just starting to break out and a German Lutheran and a British Quaker were saying goodbye to each other on the train station and you all know the story but the viewers probably don't and they were shaking hands and they were recognizing <laughs> that, that here, their respective countries are going to go to war and expect them to treat each other like enemies. But they knew, no, no, we're, we just had a handshake here. We're going to keep on working for peace and not let the countries, the governments of the countries, turn us into enemies against each other. So they were literally a fellowship of reconciliation. So the British guy went back home and um, got some friends together and they kept that thing alive. And then the next year he came to the United States to visit and started the U.S. branch and the German uh, Lutheran happened to be the chaplain to the Kaiser, so he was really not allowed to, <laughs> to follow up on this, but he still had his beliefs. But, but all throughout this history of nearly 100 years, we've opposed every war from World War I on and worked simultaneously to, to promote social justice and economic justice and help people of different races and nationalities and religions understand and appreciate each other. And in, like in South Africa, the, the FOR chapter was multiracial, which was illegal. But they're not going to let the government, the, the apartheid government of South Africa, turn them against each other just because they're of different races. So there's all this, always this reconciling. And we did US, USSR uh, exchanges of people and all kinds of stuff. And we're still doing We're doing one with, with, Afghanistan, Afghanistan, with Iran, Iran right now. Iran, yeah, yeah we do things with Iran and, and so forth. So it's a great model. And this is part of the new way is you you just don't let the government turn us into enemies. Right. We're going to be friends no matter what. Right. I think that's good. I want to put in a plug for the phone number and the website for the Western Washington office. It's 206-789-5565 or www.wwfor.org. So that's good. There are a lot of other organizations. War Resisters League is great. I've belonged to them since 1972. Uh, Veterans for Peace, you're active in that, and we all have connections. We collaborate a lot, a lot. Mm -hmm. with Veterans for Peace. National Priorities Project works on the financial budgetary things. Um, there are some books. You mentioned uh, Chalmers Johnson's book. He has Blowback and Sorrows of Empire and some others. 
there's just a lot of good stuff. Erica Chenoweth and uh, Maria Stefan wrote this wonderful book based on research about how nonviolence actually works better right. than military violence or, or any kind of violence if you're doing a, a resistance movement against a dictator or an invading army or whatever. There's a lot of resources available and people can always contact us for for more, I mean, either your office or, or, or Olympia. Or Olympia. I want to thank Ellen Finkelstein and Larry Kirshner for being our guests. I want to thank all the folks who've been watching. A great many people enjoy proclaiming that America is number one. And after the Soviet Union collapsed, many politicians and many mainstream media people proclaimed that, that we are the only remaining superpower. And if you look at how the United States functions with other countries, uh, there's a, a lot of swagger and a lot of violence and the sense that the United States can do anything that we want to other people. Not everybody is happy about this. The writers of the ancient Greek tragedies recognized the meaning of the Greek word hubris, and this has to do with the arrogance that comes before a person falls. In the old Wild West, the most insecure person was the guy who claimed to be the fastest gun in the West. If you were saying, oh, I'm about the 50th or 60th fastest, nobody's going to be gunning after you. But the guy who thought that he was the fastest and bragged about it, he was the guy that everybody was gunning after. Excessive militarism makes us less secure. It provokes enemies. It recruits terrorists. It's killing and disabling a whole generation of young Americans. It hurts our economy. It bankrupts our nation. It undermines democracy in the United States and it's corrupting our nation's soul. Rather than protect our nation, excessive militarism is harming our nation. To save the U.S., we have to scale that way back. You can get information about a wide variety of issues from the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. And I always ask people at the end of the show to remember that we're all one human family. We all share one planet. We can make the world a better place, but we all have to work at it. And the world needs what you have to offer. Thanks.